Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier. Joined as always my co-host, Nick Filato. I have the mic fixed, the mic gate 2023 last night. I did not like having a bad mic, but eh, I don't know. Something was wrong with it. I thought the wire was effed. Thankfully, it's not because that would have taken a while to get a new one. But I got the good mic going again. And for those of you who heard it last night, I was on a little bit of a rant last night. I, you know, some people are tweeting about it today. Uh, they like what I said. Some people do. Actually, I haven't had anyone who doesn't yet, but look, sometimes it just takes over and I can't do anything about it. And I was so disgusted watching that game yesterday. We just watched the tape on it today. Nick and I it was equally as disgusted as Nick said before the podcast. It was the worst offensive film he's ever watched. It was the most disgusting offense film I ever watched. And I have some concerns when I watch this tape, Nick, like I just put up a play before this. I don't think it's one of the ones we have going over, but I'll just bring it up now then of uh, right after DeVito took the sack on like the second and four, after they got a six yard game on first down, it was a two yard sack. And you know, some people were like, Oh, maybe that's why they didn't throw the third down. They had Barkley open on an arrow route on a Texas route. Barkley, you could see him jumping. Like this was a touchdown, but the ball gets batted, but you can't sit here and tell me there were no opportunities for that type of play. The rest of the game that was in the second quarter toward the end of halftime. Like there's just no way Dable or anyone could sit here and tell me there weren't any passing opportunities because once you run the ball 14 times in a row, there's going to open up some kind of opportunity, whether that be for Barkley, you know, one-on-one -on -one or something to that of that nature. And so it just, it just, to go back and watch what they did, it was just disgusting. It's just not a way to win football games long term. You could have maybe won that game and it would have been great, I guess, but not really. That's not a ceiling. There's no ceiling to it. So we won't get back into the whole rant about fake football, but did feel like watching even watching the tape like I wasn't watching NFL football. I felt like I was watching something from I can't even say something from the 60s, Nick, because I recently watched the Joe Namath Super Bowl and they were slinging the ball all around the field. People act like that football was all run run. It actually wasn't. Maybe for some teams it was. So, you know, we won't get back into it, Nick, but I did want to start with that. That, that play that you brought up, yeah. the arrow route, that mm -hmm. was the second time the Giants called it. The Giants called that with Tyrod as well. Yeah. And Tyrod looked, it was in the red zone. <clears throat> Tyrod threw the pass to Darius Slayton, which was a catchable throw. We'll go through that play a little bit yeah, later. It but it was that same concept at the end of the first half that the Giants went back to when Tommy DeVito... He knew exactly where to go with the football, but as you said, it was batted Bad. down at the line of scrimmage. But before we get into all this tape, there is some Giants news that yes. we have to go over. Yeah, so we decided to combine the podcast tonight. But this is the offensive film review. We're going to do a defensive film review like we always do as well. This will be the Leonard Williams trade plus the offensive film review, because let's be quite frank, there isn't much film to break down on offense. We actually have Nick found a way to, to break down a bunch of plays, but you guys know, you guys saw it. The Giants didn't really run an offense in week eight. I wouldn't call that an NFL offense. I don't know what I would call what they ran that game. Um, I would call it a clock killing. You're on a, you have the ball and you're just trying to kill the clock type of quote unquote offense. But this trade today was really astounding to me, Nick. Uh, when the news first broke, I really thought it was a fake account for me and Rappaport, so I had to double check that. It was a real account. I'm starting to make some more sense of it as to why Seattle was willing to give that much. I mean, they give up a second and a fifth round pick draft capital for Leonard Williams, who's 30 years old, in a contract year, on the decline. I mean, yes, the stats are okay this year. He has good pressure numbers. I think his tape has been so-so. I think he's had moments on tape of good and bad, but I think it needs to be accounted for the fact that he is playing next to Dexter Lawrence, who's eating up double teams and taking on a lot of double teams. So your stats should be better because of that. But with all that said, a second and fifth round pick now, part of the reason is the Giants are going to take the cap it for Leonard Williams. But doesn't matter. This is kind of the point of why this trade remains a steal for me, Nick. To get a second and a fifth, obviously on the surface, it looks like a, a total steal for the Giants. But it's actually not so bad for Seattle because Seattle essentially gets him for free cap-wise this year. All they have to do is give up a second and a fifth for the rental of having him hopefully you know, take them on some kind of run in the playoffs. And they may think if they let him go next offseason, they can maybe get a comp pick back. But a few things here. The Giants were not guaranteed to get a comp pick if they had just held on to Leonard Williams and let him walk. That comp pick might've been a four or three, or it might've been nothing if they signed people in free agency and the giants still have cap space, even after taking on Leonard Williams cap. It. So for example, if the giants had traded Leonard Williams to Seattle and Seattle had to take on most of the cap, it, they would have probably got back a fifth round pick. If anything for Leonard Williams at max to get that second round pick added in the giants absorbed the cap it, but here's why it doesn't matter. The giants don't, first of all, they don't need any more cap space for this year. They're two and six and they just traded Leonard Williams. That shows you if anything that they're probably not thinking about this year right now, they'd have to go on some miraculous run to get a wild card spot. Even then there's no real ceiling for any kind of playoff run. Let's be honest with ourselves about what we're watching. 
So you start with that. The second, so cap for this year means nothing. I don't care about taking on the cap, but there was the void year that is in play here, Nick, because they added the void year to co Leonard's contract because they had to restructure because Gettleman's bullshit. And so they had to find a way to get some cap space. And so there still is the matter of the void year. So the Giants will be taking a dead cap hit from what I understand. And somebody on Twitter did a great job breaking this down. Greg Thompson, uh, Tom set from cover one, who knows a lot more about the cap than I do. And the Giants will be taking on a dead cap at next year with Len Williams. But guess what? Who cares? Who cares? This is why it doesn't matter, Nick. One, the Giants are set to have 54 million in cap space before this dead cap. It's a little eat a little into that. Two, cap space is overrated. Everyone always, oh, I want cap space 100 million, 120 million, 70 million. For what? There's no free agents worth spending on most of the time. Anyone who's good doesn't hit free agency with the exception of like Brandon Sheriff randomly. The Giants have already extended their own in Dexter Lawrence, in Andrew Thomas. The young guys that they needed to worry about having cap space for are already accounted for. There's still maybe Xavier McKinney and a couple others. But with that said, Nick, they don't 54 million is plenty. They can eat into some of next year's cap to get a chance at a second round pick that can be insanely useful. Imagine if they use that second round pick on a Zach Charbonnet type, right? A great running back to potentially replace Barkley long term or an interior offensive lineman that they just totally scout really well and nail on a guard. A good, those are really the positions I'm looking at with that second, second round pick, Nick. And it's just going to be BPA anyway. So who cares? They might find another position they like, but that's where they can really hit immediate impact player. I think right with a running back or, a, or an interior offensive or defensive lineman. And so it, and that restarts the rookie contract because whatever they get, whoever they get with that second round pick, they acquired from Seattle. And obviously they get a fifth too next the year after, but that guy is under contract for 1 million against the cap or 1.2 million against the cap for four straight years of team control. So to me, this was a slam dunk trade by Joe Shane, arguably his best value trade I've seen him make. And I get why it happened for Seattle, but I still think from the Giants standpoint, it, it just knocks it out of the park. This is excellent for the New York Giants. We never expected to get a second and a fifth in the subsequent year for yeah. Leonard Williams. We were talking about this last night. We're like, what are we going to get for Leonard Williams? Like a fifth with that cap hit? No one's trading for him. Seattle just swoops in. Seattle just got Frank Clark. They brought him back. They obviously wanted to add depth to their defensive front. And Leonard Williams is perfect for that system. They're going to line in, in uh, even fronts. They're going to put Lenny at five tech. They're going to put him at three tech. He could do so many different things for that front. What a freaking second round pick. Now we got to root for Seattle to lose as many games as possible <laughs> to ensure that that pick is as high as it can be. And I hate doing that because I love Leonard Williams and I love Julian Love. But guess what? Guy's got two second round picks now. I'm excited about this. You're going to be picking in the top 10 because the Giants absolutely suck this year. So I love this move by Joe Shane. It was an absolute home run. We'll see if they make any more moves right now. It's about two o'clock Pacific time. Uh, we're recording. So maybe there's something else that's going to come down the pipeline before Tuesday's deadline. But yeah, absolute home run. And you know what, man? This was Dave Gettleman's plan the entire time. Yeah, I'm going to trade. I'm going to trade a, a third round pick in 2019. But you know what? We'll get a second back in 2023 when I'm definitely not going to be here anymore. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is funny. Like, yeah, like the Giants actually acquired more draft capital for Leonard Williams at 30 years old as an impending free agent than they gave up to get it's him. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yes. Of course, <laughs> it's financially, we have to factor that in. Like the Giants, when they traded for Leonard Williams, they gave up all their contract leverage and they had to resign him to a massive deal versus Seattle. Seattle, who is taking on none of the financial burden here. They're just giving up the picks, but still. And they're the in Giants, a playoff they're, run. Too. And they're in a playoff run. The Giants were two <laughs> and six at the time when they traded for Leonard Williams. Like totally. They were worse than that. They were worse than two and like, Two and seven, maybe. Oh, dude, they, they they were bad. I think it was like week nine was his first game with the Dallas Cowboys. I think they might have only had one win at the time going into week nine, and then they lost Absolutely. that game. I think that was the game when Ezekiel Elliott, all they did was run like outside zone and, and, and off tackle type runs, and Zeke just couldn't stop running all over the Giants. So it's it's like, a oh wild, wild move to make for a GM who's going to then go out and like spend all the capital he's going to spend on the interior defensive line after that anyway and before that anyway with Lawrence and BJ Hill and all those guys. By the way, I saw a crazy stat today from, I think, Breer or one of those guys, Dexter Lawrence, or no, it was from PFF guy, Dexter Lawrence. Sorry if I forget who it was. It might've been uh, Sam Monson or maybe it was, um, it was Steve Palazzolo, I think. So eh, trying my best to credit. I Good job, remember. by the way, with that last name. Yeah. Trying my best to credit when I can. I can't remember uh, all, all the credit, but Dexter Lawrence leads the NFL this year in pressures when lined up under the, uh, as a nose tackle under the center with 31. The next highest player is six. He has yeah. 25 more pressures from the nose. But you know who that player is, right? No, who? You might not see this stat. BJ Hill. 
<laughs> no, no, I didn't see that. Stat. Too bad we couldn't have him. We had to give up fucking Billy. We had to get Billy Price in because of the panic oh, at the center. Position. Desperate times. Calls that was for... a good scouting job by by Gettleman. He could have got credit for that one if he didn't panic trade him. I mean, he really would have got credit for another hit because he's had a nice career with the Bengals since the trade, and he's second uh, to Dexter Lawrence in that regard. And similar to, it's just funny from a scouting standpoint. I remember hearing Dave say the same thing he said about. Lawrence from a scouting standpoint, as he said about Hill with their ability to unlock their hips and kind of move for that size, which, you know, has to play a role when you're lined up over the center and you're getting pressure against the center from that position. He, he said the same thing about Will Hernandez too. He did. He just, you're right. He did. Lie. <laughs> It, hips but, do not no, lie, Dan. Yeah, that is true. He did say that about Will Hernandez, so maybe that's just his go-to line. But yeah, I think overall, when it comes to this trade, to get a second round pick back for any, I think if you could have told me before yesterday, Nick, that the Giants would get a second round pick at all, even if that meant dangling a Barkley type, they would not be able to do it. Because of course. we saw last week, the Eagles, Howie Roseman did his Howie Roseman thing, and he got Kevin Byard for essentially nothing. What was it? A swap, a pick swap, or did they give up a five or some bullshit in the in, in day three? And that's what the expectations were based on the market for what the Giants could get, especially for Leonard Williams, who is 30 years old and pending free agent. But Seattle must have liked his tape against the Seahawks earlier this year on Monday Night Football, which hopefully helped the Giants in this regard. And I know they're taking on a lot of salary, but the Giants don't need to worry about cap space this year anymore. And yes, that means a little bit of a dead cap hit next year for Leonard. They don't really need to worry about that as well. Like they're not going to grind their, they're not going to grind against the cap and sign a million free agents. There's no good for, you know, there's typically no good free agents worth spending on. They'll do some things. Of course, the Giants, they don't need $50 million to do it though. So just an A plus trade for the Giants. They're just getting a second round pick here out of this season, an extra second. A plus trade. Hopefully you get depth from it, but also it gives you more ammunition to trade up if that's what you're looking Great to point. do. We don't know how bad the New York Giants are going to be. The Giants could finish with like a top five pick. And if they want to trade up to three, say if a shitty team like Carolina, who's like, nope, we have faith in Bryce Young. That's who we're rolling with. Well, Carolina doesn't even have their pick, but whomever, say it's a team who has faith in their shitty ass quarterback, we could trade up with them and possibly um, have more ammunition to do so now. Great also, point. one more point on Dexter Lawrence and his 15 pressures. And we'll talk about this a lot on the defensive show. Right now, Dexter Lawrence is tied for league lead in pressures with freaking Nick Bosa. An edge rusher. An edge rusher. And this guy aligns over the it's nose insane. the majority of the time. Like I feel like more people should be talking about this. And the reason they're not is because the Giants suck. suck. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're <laughs> That's terrible. how it goes. Dude, the Giants are getting blown out. So it's not even like he's facing a lot of passing in the second half of games. True. He's just running through people. I had one say like um something along the lines of, yeah, how about he does this against teams that don't have I their third string guy. centers? Yeah. And I'm just like, bro, like, what are you what are you talking about, man? Like, this guy does this against everybody he's played yeah. against this year, except for Jason Kelsey's one player that right. seems to And as down. we noted, the he the Eagles give him help a lot, Kelsey. It's not the, like it's the Eagles. Wild. Yeah, the Eagles are able to give him help because right. the Giants, you can't really align in base personnel too much against that right. 11 personnel package. So you are you can dictate to the New York right. Giants defense those double teams, and that's what the Eagles have done so well offensively. Yeah, so, yeah, great point by you, though, uh, especially with the ammo to potentially trade up that they get out of the second-round pick, especially if it means they can afford to look at it like we can move our second-round pick, which is going to be like top 40, top 45, because we know we still have an extra second. Will it not be the same level of player? Sure. But they're still going to have a guy they like in the, with the range of that Seahawks pick uh, that they, that they'll have an opportunity to get like last year, for example, or two years ago with Wando Robinson, he might've been available if they had, if you know, in that type of situation, because the giants really liked him and they took him at 44, maybe they could have got him at 50 something, you know, it's that type of scenario. If they do decide to dangle that other second round pick, of course, that would have to mean they want somebody, they have a player they want to move up for. So we don't know about any of that stuff yet, but just getting a second round pick out of this season, an extra second is such a win because the Giants are two and six and we have to accept reality right now. Playoffs are a long shot. And even if they make the playoffs, this is, does not look like a team that can go on a Super Bowl run, to be quite frank. <laughs> I mean, it, it looks ridiculous to even think they can go on a playoff run at the current state right now. It's, yeah. it's very bad. But I'll say this, though, you know, the defense, the defense is playing playoff level football. Right. But yeah. they, they can't do everything, man. When your offense is going three and out consistently, I mean, Jamie Gillen's leg is probably throbbing right now. That's how much work this guy so got. So is Thomas you know, Morstead. <laughs> yeah, I know, but Thomas Morstead was actually pinning the Giants. Like, there right were now. so many drives where where I would load up the plays, and I would be like, holy shit, the Giants are just they're at the two-yard line. They're at the three-yard line. all this field position, I know. What's going on, Big Blue Banter listeners? I'm excited for the football season for several reasons. And one of those reasons is Prize Picks, which is North America's largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform. And it's so simple to use. 
Instead of battling thousands of other players, including professionals, sharks, and people who are going to exploit you, you pick more than or less than on 2-6 to six player stat projections and you just watch the winnings roll in. It's very simple to play and gives you a little extra skin. I've set my picks in less than 60 seconds. There are so many stats to choose from and the withdrawals of funds are easy and quick. Dan and I will be adding a segment to our show before every game where we pick our favorite stats, more or less yards or touchdowns, what have you, and we'll be discussing why from a scheme, matchup, and game theory perspective. I love their promotions and how easy their interface is to operate at prize picks. I may select more on tackles for a loss from Bobby Okereke or Kayvon Thibodeau next game. They also do other sports as well. It's a really cool experience. Please join Dan and I in the fun of prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. You will not regret it. Make Little Caesars, the official pizza sponsor of the NFL, Part of your game day. There are few things better in the world than kicking back, watching some football, and biting into some delicious Little Caesars pizza. Order online during our Pizza Pizza pregame, one hour before and three hours after NFL kickoffs, plus all day on Sunday. And get ready for some football and fun. Choose your favorite Little Caesars pizza or pick the toppings you crave. Old world pepperoni, pepperoni, extra cheese, Italian sausage, olives, onions, pineapple if you're into that. Put it on half the pie, the entire pie. There are so many other options that I don't have time to name. Slap that on a round crust, a thin crust, a stuffed crust, a Detroit style deep dish. Either way, you win. And speaking of winning, Everyone scores with convenient delivery or our in-store pizza portal pickup. So grab some friends and enjoy a few slices during the game. It's just crazy. And in a game like that where field position is so right. important, man, Thomas Morse, I think he's the MVP for the Jets. <laughs> he might have been their most valuable player in this game, quite frankly. Um, or Garrett Wilson. Garrett Wilson is awesome to watch. Is that- yeah, and that, that was a rough yeah. one for Deontay Banks. But, you know, sometimes you lose. Sometimes you yeah. lose against good football one of the players. Best wide receivers in the NFL. Exactly. Exactly. We'll talk more about that on the defensive podcast, but let's get into the offense. Let's get right into the play breakdowns, Nick. Um, Before we get into the yeah. uh, play breakdowns, I want to talk a little bit just about how the Jets defense didn't want this football game, it seemed like. The Giants <laughs> offense sucked and they couldn't do anything. And this might have played into why Joe Judge was so damn concerned. How many drives yeah, got Brian Dable? Brian Dable. Did I say Joe Judge? Yeah. Oh, we're leaving. Oh, that is so freaking classic, man. Talk about a Freudian slip right there. That was completely organic and not planned. <laughs> but Brian Dable, why he was being so conservative is because the Jets' defense couldn't stop just shooting themselves in the thigh. <laughs> Dude, the Quincy, Will- Quincy is Williams. Is that a Plaxico man. Burris reference? It is a Plaxico yeah, Burris <laughs> reference. Yeah. Quincy Williams nice. slapped Ben Bredesen. On a third and five at the end of the play, which extended a drive. You had the offsides, yeah. and then on the very next, you had an offsides, and then early in the second quarter, on the very next play, it was the face mask. The unnecessary roughness. Oh, no, no it was a face yeah. mask at Saquon Barkley. And this all happened when the Giants were pinned at like the, their two or three yard line. So you get an offsides. And then you get a face mask. And now the Giants are just at like, what, the 15 or the 20 yard line. It's just like, you're just giving away that great right. pump that Thomas Morstead just gave you, Jets defense. They had the fumble snap at midfield that Micah McFadden fell on. You had the unnecessary roughness on Quincy Williams again. That's the on one, the, yeah. On the Wandell Robinson hit, which was just unnecessary. That was on a second and 10. The Giants aren't going to pick up a third yep. and 10. The Giants were never getting that third. Yeah, no, that third they were event, never ever. getting that. Never. The then ball Jermaine- placement on that throw was so bad, by the yeah. way. DeVito's ball placement was horrible in this game. On yeah, the yeah. Rare times I, he had a chance to throw the ball. The very rare times, yeah. He had the one play or two, two throws to take on Barkley, which were behind Barkley. Barkley had to like turn and catch it, and then by the time he turned around, there were like three jets in his face. I'll tell you this right now, Nick. By the way, before I said I don't want to cut you off. Go, go through what you're saying. Well, there's only there's only two more, and this is the only one that I looked at, and I was like, eh, 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 okay. The Jermaine That's Johnson fine. unnecessary roughness on the third yeah. and ten. I was like, you can call it, but. Eh. I, like, I, I think it was kind of a cheese dick call. And then the Michael Clemens uh, fourth and five neutral zone mm-hmm. infraction. That it's was like the just Jets, stupid. 
Just so stupid. They were just kept, <laughs> they kept making so many dumb mistakes. Just like right, six minutes of game clock from that decision. <laughs> I know, man. It didn't matter. Like the Giants. Well, I saw it they let the ref spot the ball, but uh, well, I think it's just a oh, tap, yeah, man. You, and he does okay. he does tap the ball, yeah. the ref. And in those situations, I think they ha- they. But then there was they, another video I saw today where it looked like Kayvon Thibodeau wasn't offside, and he actually timed the snap well. And I think if it was that close, it shouldn't be called anyway on those types of plays. I, I agree with that. All these offensive tackles jumping early and, and Aiden Hutchinson timing snaps. Why can't Kayvon do it? That was one thing he did great at Oregon too. So I think that was just a bad call. I think I think you're on to something there. Yeah. Because I, I, I kept rewinding and it was like, it's not clear to me that Kayvon that Thibodeau offside. is offside. Right. It just looked like he gets such a good jump on it. But I looked at his helmet and maybe you can make the argument that the helmet was in the neutral zone, which would okay. um, which would um elicit an offsides penalty. I so think you can make the that. argument. It's just a matter of it's so close that it's, should it should be, in my opinion, not called because that they don't do it and, other times. And when and when Dan and I sit here and we and we bitch about these calls, we're not saying the Giants got screwed. That's not the perspective yeah. we're yeah. we're taking here. We're just saying right. they're worse. Like the the wor- most egregious one was the one on Dexter Lawrence. And the only reason why I'm really discussing that one and I brought it up on Twitter wasn't to make excuses on why the Giants mm-hmm. lost. The Giants deserve to lose this football game. Oh yeah. So did the Jets. Yeah, both but, teams deserve to lose this game. When you have a player of Dexter Lawrence's um, caliber who is running at Zach Wilson and then you see the guard's hand right here where his uh, where his like neck where his neck is basically and Dexter Lawrence gets turned to a point where his the backside numbers are facing Zach Wilson 99 times out of 100 that's going to be flat. That mm-hmm. one to me was like absolutely egregious. I couldn't yeah. believe they didn't flag it. Again, not an excuse as to why the Jets won the football game. Giants deserve to lose. Yeah, I don't think I feel like in general, Dexter Lawrence doesn't get a lot of those like you superstar calls you would expect for a player of his caliber. But that's just something that have the Giants have to live with, obviously. And I would say this as we go through the tape, like. I again, this is my big thing. I think preseason and training camp are just so different than regular season games. Like I'd love to see him get an opportunity with a real game plan, but there's a reason why the Giants were so conservative with Tommy DeVito in this game. Like the few times he did get a chance to throw the ball placement was really freaking bad. The throw he made to Wando Robinson was a horrific throw and it was a six yard throw. Even the throw to Bellinger, the first throw, like that's not a good ball. That has to be no, out in front of Bellinger. These are, only like, these are only like four yard throws. And then the yeah. time he has Zaquan Barkley open, he is so small in stature that he gets batted at the line. Like people talked a lot in these off season, like, Oh my God, just see DeVito. And it's a fun local story, but like, this is not someone you can count on in my opinion to develop at all. In my opinion, I don't think he's someone who you can count on as a QB two moving forward. I think the giants need to look much higher. When you start setting the bar that low for QB two, you put yourself in a very risky position. If your QB one gets hurt. And to me, he's not an NFL level caliber quarterback. He was okay. Looking at Illinois on his tape and he was horrible at Syracuse. And so just to use the preseason, and the training camp as your as your basis is not good 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 business because there's too many people who look good in training camp preseason that never cut in the NFL because it's not really like the NFL game. So I just want to make that clear. I mean, look, I, I'm not trying to drag the kid, but I just I know at, at one point I got tricked into thinking maybe he could be a developmental guy. I just don't see it with him. And and I think you need when you're developing quarterbacks, Nick, you need to have some kind of traits to back it up. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a little tough now. I want to give him the benefit of the doubt, but yeah. I think you're on to something. There are certain aspects of, of a quarterback that you can look at even in your first game and you're not necessarily in the best situation that you can point to and be like, well, if that gets developed and those other parts of his game get right. developed, maybe we'll see something. And it's not clear to me that that's the case for Tommy right. DeVito. And another interesting thing that the Jets were doing, man, especially when Tommy DeVito was in there, they showed a lot of too high pre-snap looks. And rotated. Yep. And then strongly, which we all expected, strongly rotated yeah. down into the box. And it was just like Saquon yeah. Barkley. Maybe it's not counted as eight men in the box because at the snap it wasn't. Oh. Once Saquon Barkley got the football, though, there were a ton of jets in the box. Yeah. And he was able to to make some things happen, at least. that He just, was. Yeah, man. There were there were a couple pl- a runs. Like this was one of Barkley's best games individually. It really yeah. do feel that way, considering how stacked the boxes were against him, how stacked the defense was against him. The fact that he's playing in a game plan where a team is openly saying we're not throwing the football, we're literally just running every play. Like, and there's so many different runs things to fight against. So many different running. Uh, plays yeah. too man like i have them charted here a bunch of duos a lot of dart they they really incorporated the trap which we talked to michael nanya about we knew that was going to be a part of yeah. this we saw a wildcat trap play saw a little bit of halfback draw some crack toss a lot of stuff out of weak eye and eye formation zone read play so just 
a ton of different rushing concepts. They had to get into their bag because they just did not want to throw the football. The Giants, man, too. The Giants were gifted the football near midfield on offense no. twice, and they end up taking sacks, and those drives were just absolutely ruined. No points on either of those two drives, which I also believe is another reason why Brian Dable was like, nope, we're not passing the football. Because when we did, and we tried it earlier at the end of the second quarter, we ended up just taking sacks because Tommy DeVito didn't. It wasn't even really Tommy DeVito's fault. There were times where he yeah. just hit his back foot and there were just guys all over him because yeah. the Jets were like, let's blitz a little bit against this kid. He's not going to be able. And they were right. They blitzed and yeah. they got home. Right. And that's what you do against these kind of quarterbacks. You the Howells, the Wilsons, the DeVitos. You just, in my opinion, you're doing a game, a bad game plan if you're not just blitzing against these types of good players. I don't think this was as big of a problem as it was against the Seattle Seahawks, but the loss of Darren Waller, man. Like the Giants got to yeah. find a way to find another tight end. They you can't have to do find this a way. Again. You can't be having a situation where Bellinger is the only tight end left. It's insane. You put Marcus McKethan out there as a big tight end, it just makes you that much more one dimensional. Just yeah. it, it, do something. Find another tight end. There are free agent tight ends out there. You guys right. have linked two tight ends. Maybe somebody you had in training camp at one point throughout your career. We can't just keep going into every game with just two tight ends. So if the other one gets uh, Don, if he gets hurt, the entire offense is thrown off. Right. It's like, well, we can't run 12 personnel, which they is did the this already too. And see, it's a great point, baby. This, this happened to them already versus Seattle. So why did they not learn from that mistake? That's another knock on the coaching staff, at least as far as this year goes, because that's a great point by you, because this happened already in see against Seattle. So. I know when I thought like they would, they would rectify that situation. You, you got Lawrence Cager on your practice squad, but Lawrence Cager, look, I like him. He's a good athlete. He's not a tight end. He's not, yeah. he's not the tight end that you want. If something specifically happens to Daniel Bellinger, now something happened to Darren Waller. We have no idea how long that's going to persist here with the offense. Now you can promote Lawrence Cager, but what you're going to do about the insurance for Daniel Bellinger. And what are you going to do when you want to run 12 personnel? And Lawrence Cager is getting thrown away like right. tissue paper. You got to find a tight end block, man. Jeez. So the Giants defense put the Giants offense into a position where they could score. And here's the third and four play where uh, I was talking about a little bit earlier where Saquon ends up coming open here. I love the route concept, but Tyrod looked for the slot fade after looking at the after looking at the safety. You can see that from the end zone angle. And this is a very catchable pass. And this is something that we brought up on the podcast before. Look, we love Darius Slayton on this podcast. We think he's a good wide receiver, but great true number one wide receivers make plays like this on the football to help their offenses out. And it just seems like a lot of times Darius Slayton isn't able to come down with these close contested catches. Yeah, definitely not his specialty here. Um, he's forced to obviously flip his shoulders there because he's expecting the ball inside and then has to go outside, but still definitely a catchable football without a doubt. You can even see it from that angle, how catchable it really is. If he makes a better play on it um, drops right over, Maybe extend for it, maybe dive for it. I'm not exactly sure, but there's got to be a way to get a better chance on that football. But it is interesting to watch Saquon Barkley wide open too on that arrow route, and that would have been an even easier throw and pitch and catch touchdown, essentially a layup touchdown for uh, the Giants. But obviously, you would require Taylor doing exactly what he did, which is flashing his eyes toward the slot fade so he can hold that second level linebacker and then flipping back to Barkley. But I think he just made his mind up pre snap based on the look that he was going with the slot fade. Yeah, he saw the safety and he knew he had the one-on-one -on -one matchup. Right. So I'm not necessarily knocking Taylor for this, but the Giants coaching staff noticed how the Jets played this. And this is a well-constructed play in the red zone because you're using Darren Waller essentially as a pick. You're going to flare Saquon Barkley out to the flat and you're going to force the defender who was matching Saquon Barkley out to the flat to go over the top of Darren Waller. And he goes over the top, which opens up the inside. So Tyrod at this point, he's already thrown the football and made the decision that I have the one-on-one. -on -one. I'm throwing it to Darius Slayton. But you could see Saquon Barkley is wide open and this would have been a walk-in touchdown if Tyrod was able to flip back. And, and that safety yeah. didn't make a play, but that safety is also not there because he is going over to help with Darius Slayton, even though he's not in position to. But I do like how the Giants went back to this in a high leverage situation with Tommy DeVito. But of course, it was for not. Yep. Now we're going to go through a second and seven. Quarter two, 1046 left. Going to have a little bit of a smash to the boundary side. We have that tight stack, that condensed stack inside the numbers. We're going to get a smash concept there. And Tyrod Taylor, he's a little bit late to see this drive spot to the uh, field side. We're going to see, you see how you have that in-breaking route, and then you have Darius Slayton who just sits. Now, if this was man coverage, he would drag, but this is the choice type of route that we refer to when we're, when we're talking about and discussing Brian Dable's offense. It's his own. So Darius Slayton does a great job sitting and then flowing away from coverage, but Tyrod never sees this. He kind of stayed, it looks like, maybe a little bit long on Daniel Bellinger, thinking that Sauce Gardner was going to jump down on Wondell Robinson, but Sauce does a really good job getting to depth. And then when... um. 
when when Tyrod realizes what's going on, he went to the check down. We saw that last week, the check down to Saquon Barkley. Remember, we were like, remember when we got the yep. football to Saquon Barkley? And you can see how right here he goes, let me get it to Saquon. Saquon's covered, and he just never sees t- t- um, Darius Slayton just sitting there at the numbers wide yeah. open, and Tyrod ends up getting hit and just threw it away. Yeah, this was one that that stood to, stood in my mind as well, just because it's just the processing there. You hope to get the open receiver on that spacing concept, but go ahead. Here's a trap run near the end of the second quarter. Tommy DeVito is in the game. We talk a lot about traps on this podcast, and if anybody needs a visual, this is what a trap is. You pull an offensive lineman to block an unblocked defender to the play side. So the backside tackle here, Tyree Phillips, he's going to pull to the front side of the play. 94 is not going to be blocked. Brim Bredesen kind of touches him a little bit. And then you can see how he gets ear holed. And now if you look at the second level, you have two offensive linemen up at the second level. And then Saquon Barkley just picks up, I think, six yards on this play. Just wanted to kind of show what the trap run is all about. And it also bleeds into the next play that I'm going to run, which was coming out of the two-minute warning, the second and four after that six-yard run. Giants are nearing field goal range, even with Graham Gano getting hurt. And the Giants take a sack on this play on the second and four, which effectively knocks them out of field goal range. And you can see how Tommy DeVito hits his back foot and the blocking scheme had Daniel Bellinger blocking Jermaine Johnson, just not yep. a good, not a good situation with uh, deep concepts. And then Wandell Robinson running that kind of motion to flare out. And it's just really no chance for Tommy DeVito. And uh, I think this was an, again, another reason why the giants were like, yeah, we're not going to be passing the football with this guy back there. Yeah, and on the trap play from two plays ago, I thought it was a good example of John Michael Schmitz's natural ability to climb to the second level. He just does a really good job, in my opinion, of looking natural while climbing, and that's something that's going to help the Giants moving forward. As far as this play goes, like you said, it's another one of these weird matchups the Giants have where they have a tight end blocking an edge. I don't really know exactly why, but every time they try this, it looks like this, where the tight end can't block the edge because he's a tight end, and he's not supposed to be taking pass sets and, and blocking there. And even there, you can kind of see as Bellinger moves forward, he kind of gives, he gets beat, I guess, by that move. It was actually a pretty good move by Jermaine Johnson with that inside step first. Yeah, Jermaine Johnson is a good football player, but the Giants, they pull the backside guard, uh, Glowinski, to take the blitzer. As they slide, they full slide their protection to the right. So they're full sliding. So you just take the guard and he's going to take that blitzing, protect the edge. But in doing so, that's going to isolate Jermaine Johnson against Daniel Bellinger, which was the issue on on this specific play, ends up going for a sack. And now we're going to have a third and eight. This is the next play after that. And there's the Saquon Barkley coming wide open. So you can see it come full circle here. Saquon Barkley gets the linebacker to extend to the numbers, and then he breaks to the inside, and there's no one there. And C.J. Mosley just does such a good job watching Tommy DeVito and and seeing his intentions and, and knocking the football down at the line of scrimmage. Yeah, this is one of those examples where it does pay to have a taller quarterback who can throw over the top of the defense. You could do that. If if he completes this pass, I, I'm not sure, and it's hard to tell how accurate this throw would have right, been. Right, right. If he completes this pass, man, Saquon might house call this. Yeah, he will. If it's good ball placement, it's a, it's a definite house call. There were so many instances in this game. You could say this about any football game where it's just like, dude, if the Giants just did one little thing differently yeah. here, they they would won this game. And it's just, oof, yeah. it's just so rough, man, that this happens so frequently for them. But yeah, you could see. And now we are going to have a it's just a another trap run. This is the one that ends up going for 34 yards. Now, there's really no one to trap. Quinnen Williams gets around Justin Pugh, so he's already wide. So Glowinski's like, all right, you took yourself out of the play. I'll just finish you off. And then Saquon just makes two guys miss and accelerates. And yeah, I, I, Sorry, what were you going to say? Yeah, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, people might be like, hey, man, 2018 Saquon houses this. I don't know if he, if he does because three, like he kind of plays into three by running towards him. What, what's, your, what's your mindset on that? Do you think he houses this? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I've I've seen him house worse angles than that in 2018. I don't think necessarily he's the same kind of elite speed that he had. I mean, it's not, I don't think this, the, the stats back it up. His yeah. breakaway speed, his, I'm sorry, his breakaway numbers, his break, and these are charted by pro football focus are down across the board since, since his rookie season. But this one specifically, I think you're right. The angle might not be there regardless, but I've seen him erase worse angles versus the Jaguars in, in 2018 and a few other games. So I don't know. It's hard to say. Well, he has sauce also coming in from the backside. Coming, yeah. yeah. But this Quincy William character, man, uh, Quinnen's older brother, bro. He's a 
damn physical, undisciplined, yep. but good linebacker, man. And you can see there's a lot of pursuit speed right there. And yeah, uh, Saquon kind of has to run in to number three. And now we're going to have the Tommy DeVito touchdown, dude. It just really goes to show how much the Jets were paying attention to <laughs> Saquon Bar. <laughs> like, like an insane amount. Because both defenders, even the secondary yeah. contain guy, like the first guy's like, I'll go, you'll take contain on Tommy DeVito. He's even like, <laughs> nah, man, that, that kid, that kid ain't keeping the football. This is a good read by Tommy DeVito because the Jets were being very aggressive and Saquon would have been dead. And Tommy DeVito gets a rushing touchdown out of it. So good for him. Yeah. Only touchdown of the game for the Giants. Yeah. And this play I just wanted to put in just to showcase how fun Saquon Barkley is. That's I just tweeted this this play and I was like, look how fun Saquon Barkley is. Such a fun player. Like one juke of Mosley has a juke around Justin Pugh, who's just laying on the ground, and then make a linebacker miss in doing so. And then he spins almost off a tackle and oh, gets tripped yeah. up. It's just, uh, I mean, he's definitely spoiler Great individual alert. play. I don't know if we'll be doing superlatives because this was such a gross game, but if we were, the best overall player would easily be Saquon yeah. Barkley. Yeah. Who the had only, a, um, the only player in the mix for this. Yeah, it's not even like the offensive line really did all that great. I'd no. love to say like like John Michael Schmitz had a great game. I, I don't no. necessarily think he had a great game. It wasn't it was a solid. terrible game. No, it was it wasn't solid. terrible. The tackles the offense, weren't that good. I didn't think in pass pro, the rare times they got an opportunity to. The, the rare times they had yeah. the opportunity, exactly. Now we're, just, now we're just going to have a six-yard run. Dude, this is, and I hate to bring this up. This is uh, 126 left in the fourth mm. quarter, a first and 10. And this is one of those moments that I was just referring to where – if one thing changed, if something happened a little bit differently, the Giants win the game. And right. I, Saquon Barkley is the last person that you can blame for this loss. Saquon Barkley put everything out there. Yeah. And I think he was just the biggest professional about it, especially since he doesn't have a long-term contract. Everything about right. Saquon I love. But if Saquon, I don't know why he does, goes down here. And I hate to call him out on that, but like, if he doesn't go down here, the Giants win the football game and he just goes down. Like He just yeah, dropped. I think maybe it's partially because... The last time he was in this situation, Nick, was week two against the Cardinals. And his decision there to go as hard as he could cost him another injury and cost him another three games. Maybe uh, that's part of it. I'm not sure. I, d I mean, like, that was not, like, not, and that's not a knock the, on him, by the way. I know, I know. Towards the line of screen. I don't this think is he a, been in that game. This is a great cutback. And you can even see the the blocks it on the backside. Back. Tyree Phillips and Tyree Phillips does a great job cutting the backside defender. And then Daniel Bellinger shoves his defender into them. So you have both the backside defenders are eliminated and Barkley recognizes this. Everyone aggressively flows to yep. the front side of the play. And CJ Mosley is the player to watch. CJ Mosley, number 57 right there, aggressively flows. Saquon notices it, cuts back. This is a game-winning cut right there. A game-winning yeah. vision by Saquon Barkley. Everything about this is going to secure the New York Giants a victory. All they need is that first down. And I just don't, I, yeah, and I said this during there, the game, right? He just go he goes down, and I don't know why exactly. Because if he just gets this first down, it, it's win. And again, Saquon is the last person we're blaming for this loss, but that was a really peculiar decision, in my opinion. Yeah, it is, and it's a good example of what I was saying yesterday too, when people were getting on. Oh, Kayvon Thibodeau, but he had the offsides, which, by the way, Nick and I don't even really feel should have been called. You can't look at one play like that when. If the guy didn't have his uh, three sacks, the Giants would have never even been in that position. Same goes here. And I know you're not saying this, obviously. I know. Yeah. Like, this is what we're trying to clear up here. Like, yeah, Saquon might have, you know, had a chance to ice the game here and didn't take it, but they wouldn't even be in this game without Saquon Barkley or Kayvon Thibodeau in this regard. Those those three players, Thibodeau, Barkley, and, and Dexter Lawrence. So it's just like, it is weird, though. It does suck to see because like, you're right. If he just powers through that, that cut and gets vertical, that's probably an easy first down for him. I mean, he's picking up at least a couple extra yards and you have the two right. plays to possibly because he picked up, I think, six on this run. He probably could have picked up. Another three. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a, a, that's a rough one, man. That's a rough. Maybe he thought he had the first down because it was a longer developing play. I'm not 100 yeah. percent certain. But uh, again, Saquon Barkley was amazing in this game for the New York Giants. Yeah. And so superlatives not worth going through. I don't think this week Barkley would have won best player. Grades on the offensive line weren't going to be as good as they were last week, in my opinion, at least. The run blocking had some moments, but that's going to happen when you have a million attempts at it. Uh, instead, I kind of want to move it forward, Nick, to what we could see going forward, because today the other news that we didn't touch on was Daniel Jones got cleared, um, apparently got cleared on Sunday morning, which I know some people have been concerned with because they're like, why was he not made QB2 for this game if he was cleared? And, you know, even if you don't want to get him hit against the best defense or whatever, at least you could have had him run some kind of offense out there that has a passing element to it. So it's worth considering from that standpoint. But regardless, moving forward, what's important is there's a chance for us to watch better Giants football moving forward with Daniel Jones cleared with John Michael Schmitz back 
with Andrew Thomas hopefully back next week. We'll see what happens on that front. I don't think that's a guarantee. Jalen Hyatt getting more snaps, at least last week and the week before. I didn't check his snap count for this game. It's not worth checking anyway. They didn't run an offense, so it doesn't really matter. Um, they didn't run a real offense. Again, I keep saying real. That's the word I'm using. It's like I, I feel like I'm that that lady on the plane like, this guy's not real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I got to get a drop for that. Yeah. Yeah. I gotta get a drop real. That. It didn't feel like a real offense, and it wasn't. So I don't really care if Hyatt played a lot of snaps in this game or didn't. It doesn't matter. They weren't running. Played 25 offense. for context. Who cares, though? They weren't even running yeah. an offense. So as I said a million times. But as we move it forward with Thomas back, hopefully Hyatt getting more of the snap shares we saw in the two weeks before this. And obviously Wondell Robinson, who wasn't really a huge part of Daniel Jones's early season run. That's three pieces that Jones is going to get that he didn't really have this year. Thomas, he had for a quarter. Jalen Hyatt, he had for a few snaps here and there. Wondell Robinson, a few snaps here and there. That's three major players and even Barkley to an extent who we didn't get to play that many games with. So I'm looking forward to seeing what Daniel Jones can give the Giants moving forward. I think the matchup against the Raiders is a good start in a dome, controlled weather, not the best defense. Obviously, it's Patrick Graham who has an idea of how to stop Jones, which can't help, but we'll see what happens there. Schedule short gets week. a little lighter. What'd you say? They're on a short week, too. They're, uh, they're on a short week. That helps. The Raiders are on a short week. I'm just excited to see real offense again, and this is a big point, turning point for the Giants. Like They may be out of it for the playoffs at 2-6 and six or close to it, but the rest of the season, as it goes, is Daniel Jones's season at this point. This is a prove it period for Daniel Jones, whether you like it, whether I like it, or whether anyone likes it. Because if the Giants don't play well and he doesn't improve the passing game, they're going to be in position to potentially draft a quarterback, and they might draft a quarterback. If he does play well and he improves the passing game, the Giants are going to win games because of it, and they're not going to be in position to take the quarterback, and therefore he will guarantee himself another year as the Giants quarterback. So it's all on his plate, in my opinion, at this point. He has to improve the passing game. He has to find a way to find consistency in the passing game. He has to find a way to get defense to stop stacking the box against him, to stop playing trap coverages against him, to stop driving down on everything at the sticks, to stop playing no respect from a safety standpoint, to stop leaving the field side open. These are all on him at this point, in my opinion. Yes, the O-line it has to play a role in this too, but the O line in my opinion can improve to some degree moving forward with Andrew Thomas back, obviously. So that's what I'm looking forward to as we move forward in the offense, Nick, I'm looking forward to hopefully some better film from the giants passing game. That's what I'm looking forward to as well, but the Darren Waller injury could throw yeah, a little bit hurt. of a wrench into this and in, this entire conversation because losing him is a, is a big deal. We never even really got to see Daniel Jones and Darren Waller thrive together because the team was so pathetic on offense earlier in the season. Hopefully he can come back, and uh, we'll have to wait and see what the hell the Giants do at tight end. Maybe they just promote Lawrence Cager and, and roll the dice again, but I, I don't know, man. I think they're, they're, it's an oversight, and it's yeah. bit them in the ass twice this season already. In two I think losses. Tanner Hudson's on the Bengals now, but otherwise I would have yes, brought back yeah. my boy Tanny Hudson. I like Tanner Hudson, but they'll have to figure out something there for sure because it looks like Waller's going to be – I would assume this is a multi-week absence. He was immediately ruled out, and he's had hamstring issues all year and his whole career, basically. Yeah, I'm right there with you. So we'll see what happens there. But better days are ahead, at least for Nick and I, and hopefully you guys, if you like watching offensive film, because there's going to be more fun plays to break down, we assume. Hopefully the Giants offense can get going with Daniel Jones a little bit in the second half. But thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed our reaction to the Leonard Williams trade as well. Uh, stay tuned on Big Blue Banter. The next thing coming will be the defensive film breakdown. Have a great rest of your night, and we'll talk to you soon.